Okay, uh, let's begin. So last time we discovered kind of discontinuity. I'm going to do a few definitions and some terminology here. Last time. Make sure we know what this is. I don't know if I ever wrote this down actually. I just said to be discontinuous. At x equals a, if that is not continuous. The equation that describes continuity at that point does not work. So that means uh, the function is discontinuous at the point. It does not um, fulfill the continuity equation. This means it'll have a hole or a gap or a break or some craziness going on. So we can have discontinuities. Um, they are removable if we can fix them simply by redefining the function at a finite number of points, which means the discontinuities have to be of the form of a whole, right? where we can just fill in the point that's misbehaving. Um, so those are called removable discontinuities. They're ones that we can fix without really changing the spirit of what the function is supposed to accomplish. Um, you have non-removable discontinuities. So not removal basically means you can't fix the function by redefining it at a few points. And so these discontinues are not removable. And such discontinues are called essential. These are discontinuities that you can't fix simply by redefining the function at a finite number of points without drastically changing the function and its behavior. Um, you have two main types um, that we can identify easily. Um, one is called the jump discontinuity. So this is like when your function at the point A literally makes a jump somewhere else. 
and you might have what we call infinite distance. For example, what is exhibited by 1 over x squared at the origin, right? Infinitely discontinuous. You're making an infinite jump. So just want to make sure that we have that, that language down. So when something is not continuous, <coughs> we say it's discontinuous there. Um, discontinuities can be removable or non-removable. The removable ones are called essential because you literally can't, you have to keep them. Um, to change them, you'd have to literally change the entire, an infinite number of points on the function, which will drastically change how the function is meant to behave. So for example, to fix this jump discontinuity, I'd have to either take all points on the right and shift them down, or all points on the left and shift them up. That will drastically change how the function behaves. I'd literally be creating an entirely new function, rather than just patching one up. So the removable ones are precisely the ones that have holes in them. And the jumps are infinite discontinuities, so you can't remove them. I want to do a couple of examples, then talk about something else. So this is like you want to construct a function that is continuous. Uh, I actually gave you a problem like this on the quiz in the bonus problem. Um, so let's see how um, these can be done. Maybe I, I will do the one that was on the quiz first and then do another one. And then let's hope, hopefully I can get through them. those two things. A lot of today's class is going to be mostly notes, I think, before we a few examples. <coughs> so, so these are fine. break and make sure you guys can solve problems like that. They're very common problems to ask on calculus. I'll definitely answer problem like this on test one and more than likely a problem like this will be on the final as well. So I want to make sure I didn't just want to put it on a quiz and have you guys figure it out. I want to actually write it out for you. But if there is anyone who figured it out on a quiz, maybe you can uh, help me write it out here. So, uh, did anyone think they 
got it, or how it was supposed to be done. What would you say here? Ideas? So the first thing you want to do is you want to identify points of potential discontinuities so you can fix them. Where would you think that these function, this function could be continuous? At what points? What about the top function? Where's the problem with that? can't be approaching zero. Right, just like ignore all this and just look at the function. Zero is a problem here. Is any other number a problem here? Is there any other number that you can plug in that you might have an issue? Does sign work everywhere? Yes, no. How does the sign function behave? Is it discontinuous at any point? Right, so sign is going to be fine everywhere. X is going to be fine everywhere, right? So these are just always going to be giving us two numbers no matter what we plug in for X. Which means the only issue is the one we created by dividing them. So we have to make sure we don't divide by zero. So X equals zero is the only place that potentially has a problem. 3A, well if A is going to be a number, then this 3A is going to be just a constant. It's a constant function. That also doesn't have a problem. Same thing with cosine x, that's also defined everywhere. So no problems there. Which means literally the only thing we have to worry about here is the point x equals zero. Because one, division by zero would be bad for this guy. And two, we kind of break the function up at the point where x equals zero. We know on the left what we look like, at zero what we look like, and on the right what we look like. So if x not equals zero, Fine. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, check at x equals 0, see what's going on. And so how can I make sure it's continuous at x equals 0? What do we need? Yeah? Um, well, for the top one, since that's the issue, wouldn't you have to find, like, where that's going, and then find... Well, all three are the issue, because remember, we need them to actually... Like, yeah. Uh, um, we'll find the spot. Yeah, but as a general so idea, what do we need to be continuous at zero? What do we need to happen to be continuous at zero? Yeah, what does that mean? Give me something that we can use on a math exam. You can't be just like, oh, we need them to meet. Like, how do you how do you do that? How are you going to get to these numbers, A and B, the right numbers? There must be some criteria that we have for telling if something is continuous. Yeah? Isn't the limit as x approaches 0 f of x equal to Right. We need the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x to be f of 0. So now, uh, let's unpack that. One, the function behaves differently on the left and the right. So we need to look at the one-sided limits. So we're going to check that the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of f of x, and the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x. And what is f of 0? Right? We're going to find all of those three. And we need to make sure that they all match up. They all give us the same output, the same value. Okay. So let's start with f of 0. What is f of 0? It's just 3a. It's a constant. Okay. 
not much we can do there. Let's start with the left. What is the limit that brings here from the left? Left x. Right. What is that limit? Two. Two. Right. Sine x over x as x goes to zero uh, gives us one. We know that as a general limit, so definitely from the left it should be in the same way. What is the limit as x approaches zero to the right of the x? Is the same as the limit as x approaches zero from the right of 4b cosine x? Yeah? 4b. 4b. This has the plug-in rule, can plug in x equals 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so the result here is 4b. Right? Now, according to our definition of what it means to be continuous, we need equality here, which means these three things need to all be the same. And so this means that we need 3a to be equal to 2 to be equal to 4b, or I can even break that down into two equations. 3a needs to be 2 and 2 needs to be 4b. So what is a? 2 thirds. Well, it needs to be 2 thirds. And b? Uh, needs to be 1 half. I think on the quiz I gave you nicer numbers. The, the answers are probably integers. But that's the, that's the same idea you used to solve that problem. So when you have a piecewise function, you want to tell where it's continuous. First look at each guy individually to see if there are, might be issues that aren't indicated by this guy here. Um, everyone seems to work fine as long as we weren't at zero. Um, and so at zero is where we broke into three different pieces and we have to check zero uh, in particular. Now to check zero for continuity, we need to check that this equation holds. Right? So when I said, what, what do we need to be continuous? That will always be the answer. That equation needs to hold. Right? And so now you try to apply this equation, um, but because we have these three things, it has to, we have to worry about, oh, what about the left? What about the right? And so we did that. And what about at zero? We did that. And then we just have to make sure everyone's equal, which means if I plug in A equals 2 thirds and I plug in B equals 1 half, it turns out this function will actually connect from both sides. They will each output 2 when x is 0. And on the left and right, they'll go off and do whatever they want. But at 0, they'll all meet at 2. With that in mind, what happens in the second case? What's the domain of this one? What's the domain of x minus 1 all squared? All real numbers. All real numbers. It's a polynomial. So that's what it's under. OK, what's the domain of this one? All real numbers. Also all real numbers. It's a polynomial. What's the domain of this one?
For example, I could plug in x equals minus 1 over 4, and that would actually work. Are there numbers greater than 1? No. Don't forget the definition. Where is a radical, uh, uh, the domain of a radical? What do you need? Greater than zero. Huh? Greater than zero. What? What should be greater than zero? Alright, it's not greater than zero, it's greater than or equal to zero. Right. Okay. So we need that 2x plus 1 should be greater than or equal to zero. And you just solve for x, move that so that, that must be greater than or equal to minus one half. So this guy works at minus one half to infinity. Now that should indicate an issue to you, but if we check, we have this definition uh, when x is greater than four, so we're well within this and we don't have to worry about it. Right? So we check each individually, they're all fine according to this function. Now the problem is, the function we have ourselves broken up into a piecewise function. So we need to make sure that the pieces that we broke it into would meet, right? So that's the issue. So, so the last function here kind of has an issue, but it doesn't have an issue at the location that we're looking at. So that's actually fine, they're all fine individually. Now I need to make sure that they actually connect to create one entire uh, continuous function. So, so other than, so what are the points we need to worry about? One and four. One and four. Other than x equals one and x equals four, we're fine. So now let's uh, go individually. Let's talk about x equals one. What do we need to be continuous at x equals one? The first two. Huh? The second, the first one and the second one. I don't know what that means. The fir first function. Well, what and the do we need function? to happen to be continuous at x equals one? The limit as x approaches. That's always going to be the answer. <laughs> we need to make sure that that equation holds at the location one. So let's do that. And then we're going to repeat the same process for 4. Okay. So now we again have something, a definition of the left of 1, a definition when we're bigger than 1 and equal to 1. So what is f of 1 according to this function? If we're at 1, what is the value of f of f? ax plus b. Huh? ax plus b. No. X is your input. X is 1. What is the value of the function? Where should you be looking, first of all? Top function, middle function, middle bottom function? Huh? Middle function. Oh, it's A plus B. A plus B. X is 1. Right? So it's not AX plus B. So that's at 1, that's what we look like. What about to the left of 1? So if we're looking at the limit from the left, what function should we be looking at? Top, middle, bottom? Top, middle, top. Huh? Top. Top, right? So 1 from the left means we're a little bit less than 1, coming up to 1. This is the guy where x is less than 1, so we are looking at this function. And what's that limit as x approaches 1? 0. 0. Now we check the limit as we approach 1 from the right side. What function are we looking at now? Again, the one in the middle, right? The one in the bottom is for x bigger than 4. 4 is far away from 1. The right? limit we want to get close to 1. It's still going to be the middle one because this is what's telling you when x is close to 1. Here's where x is a little bigger than 1. It's still going to be that function. So we're still taking the limit of ax plus b as x approaches 1. And that is, again, a plus b. So here, one thing we know these two give us the same information, but we do know that they should be zero. So, so far we have a plus b minus 
must equal zero. Which is not enough information to solve for A and B, of course. But then you remember, ah, 4 is also an issue. Maybe I can get some information from 4 that's going to help me solve it. So you go and you do the same thing at 4. What do you need to be continuous at x equals 4? Plug in x equals 4, so it's 4a plus b. Okay, what about the limit as x approaches 4 from the left side of f of x? That is the limit as x approaches 4 from the left of what function? If we're looking at 4 from the left, who should we be looking at? The middle one. The middle one, right? Here, it tells us when x is less than 4, Coming up to four. Now it turns out that is again four a plus b by our plugging in rule. What about the limit as x approaches four from the right? Oh, yes. Where should we be looking now? The bottom one. This is where we're bigger than 4. 4 from the right means we're coming from this side. So we're a little bit bigger than 4. So we're looking at the limit as x approaches 4 from the right of this function. We can approach 4 from the right because this domain here is from minus half to infinity. So 4 is definitely rules. It has some cushion in there. So we can definitely approach 4 from the right or the left. And so what would that give you? That would give you 3 by the plug-in rule. So here we can conclude 4a plus b must be equal to 3. How do we find a and b? Now we have a system of equations, a 2 by 2 uh, system of equations. Is that three? That is three. Okay, so tons of ways you can know how to solve it. Give me one of them. Equation 1, equation 2. Maybe you guys solve it, tell me the answer. It's been a while since, probably since we've done systems of equations, so I want to make sure you, you know how to do this. Yeah? Um, well, if you make the second equation equal to zero, can't you just put them equal to each other? Well, A would be equal to minus B, if that's what you mean. Oh, you mean make this equal yeah. to zero? Like you can subtract 2 by 3, and then you can put A plus B is equal to 4A plus B minus 3. I would actually just leave the constants on one okay. side. Oh, okay. um, one option is to, in the first equation, there are many options, but one option, in the first equation you can solve for A, for example, and you get A equals minus B. And then you can plug that into the second equation. So now that b is the only variable you can solve for. Another option is to do something like elimination. Let's say I wanted to take the second equation and subtract the first. 4a minus a, 3a. b minus b, die. 3 minus 0, 3. 
A is 1. And since A plus B equals 0, this means that B is equal to minus 1. So that's an answer. Okay, so uh, tests and quizzes will often have a stack of limits that I would ask you to do. So in the last quiz, I believe I asked you guys like six limits, where it just so find a limit of this, find a limit of that, find a limit of that, find a limit of that. And yes, that's important for the test, but it's also important because in practice when you're trying to use a limit, a lot of times to solve a single problem, you'll have to be doing a bunch of limits. So I need you to know how to just solve a bunch of limits rapidly. Because sometimes a single problem, you'll have to do that a bunch of times. Right? I don't want you to get stuck on these little calculations here. I'm just supposed to expect you to know what you need to do. And then the execution might take several steps, but I don't want them to bog you down getting to that. So here we needed a very um, conceptual idea of continuity, which ends up being just the limit equation. But then we needed to know how to apply the limits, especially the one-sided limits. What function do we need to be looking at at any given time? And so on and so forth. And then just find the limit for the right direction. And then knowing that we need to fulfill this equation, we'll know that we need to set certain of these things equal to each other. And this brings us back to algebra class. Right? You, you have a lot going on in this single problem. So it's, it's why quizzes, I might give you a lot of problems by drills, but it's because a lot of times you have to put a lot of ideas together for a single problem, and you need to be able to do a bunch of things rapid fire. Any questions about the examples we just did? This one, anything that's unclear, any step? So you can write out the steps on your own. So for problems like these, you should remind yourself, first check each function individually to see if they have any issues on their own. Um, if you find an issue, which we did in this case, check that where the interval that we're on does not affect that issue, right? Because if it does, you'll, you'll have another thing to worry about. Okay? So that would be the first step. Then, so once you've identified where you don't have issues, Okay, other than at these points, we're okay. Then you have to figure out oh, which points would have issues. In this case, it was one and four. So we've identified one and four as the potential issues. And then to force continuity, we need to force this equation for both uh, one and four, which comes down to applying that. And in this particular instance, because of how the, the functions were broken up, we need to assess the limit by coming from the right and the left, and then assess the function at the point that we care about. Now in this case, it just so turns out, one at a time did not allow us to fully solve for any variable. We ended up in a system, uh, with a system of equations, and so we would have to do that. Let's talk about something called one-sided continuity. More notes, it's not much of an example here. Um, but basically, there are times when in context, uh, we don't want to use the entire limit to describe continuity at a point. Uh, sometimes you, it, it only makes sense to check it from one point because it's, it's kind of trivial to, or, or silly to use it from the other direction. So we can define one-sided continuity, and this is just continuity using the one-sided limits. Right? And say f of x is continuous.
as you rotate from the right side, the continuity equation is. So we can talk about one side continu continuity continues from the right side. Similarly, F is continuous from the left. because sometimes it just doesn't make sense to check something from both sides. But a function intuitively has that feeling of being continuous that we want to be able to call it continuous. Um, I'm particularly thinking about nice functions like radical x. Right? On the left side of zero, the function isn't there. But the function itself doesn't really have any breaks or gaps. It doesn't seem fair to say it's not continuous at zero. There's no hole there, there's no gap there, there's no break. It's just where the function begins. Right? It would be unfair to call radical x, so you're discontinuous. It. You know, it's kind of strange. So we've in developed this definition to talk about sometimes you only want to check continuity for one side, and, and that should be okay for us in terms of what we think of it means to exhibit continuous behavior. Uh, and so we have, uh, no, I, I don't, should we call this a definition? I don't think we should. Maybe. I'm not sure what else would more accurately describe it. We say f of x is continuous on an interval. very basic but essential example is, like I said, the square root function. It's a very nice function, and we kind of want it to be fair and included in the litany of continuous functions. So there's a function that looks like this and goes here, and so this is y equals square root of x. Right? So here, we know that y is continuous on 0 to infinity. Right? So that's an interval. That's our i in this case. But i doesn't go on forever. It does have an end point, um, namely 0. And that is included in the domain of f, the square root of function. But then, if you actually apply the limit definition of continuity at that point, you would have to conclude that radical x is not continuous at that point, because the limit from the left would not exist. There is no function. You can't get arbitrarily close from the left, right? You can only get close from the right. But this just doesn't feel to us like a discontinuous function. There's no gap, there's no break, there's no craziness. Its, it's world starts at zero, right? There is no function to the left of zero. But we, will, we would consider this continuous. the above definition. So, 
sometimes one-sided continuity, some of that we'd want to check, because sometimes from either side, the function isn't there, but it, it doesn't, um, we don't want to have to call it discontinuous. Sim similar thing, uh, y equals ln x also would have a similar issue, right? As long as we're in domain, we're there. There's no hole, there's no gap, but technically, to the left of zero, it's, it's not there. Well, it's not exactly the same, because this is an open interval. So technically, uh, you can essentially approach from the left at any point. But these are just two examples of functions where you kind of have the sense that thinking of things from both sides, it just it doesn't do the problem justice. one-sided continuity. Now I want to give you a list of functions that you can consider to be continuous functions. can be a very important and vital thing for us. So we should know that sometimes when we're working with functions, we can know whether a function is continuous or not, and we don't have to worry about this kind of check that we were doing on the previous two examples. And it turns out that these are pretty much the only functions we're going to be looking at, I'm pretty sure, in this class. And it turns out that the functions we do the most work with happen to be continuous, so that's nice. Polynomials, for example. These functions are continuous, as in continuous in general, as in continuous at every single point on their domain. That continue, continuity equation will work no matter what location in the domain you are. Radical functions are continuous. Right? Things like the square root of x, the cube root of x, x to the 1 over 7 plus whatever. Right? Where we take this version of continuous into account, because these functions might not exist at, at some point. And, but that doesn't cause them to like break or have a hole or have a gap or anything like that. We also have rational functions. And those are just ratio of polynomials. 1 minus x squared all over 2x plus 3, for example, is a rational function. These guys are all continuous on their domain. We also have the exponential functions are continuous on their domain. They're continuous functions. Um, logarithmic functions are continuous on their domain. The trig functions are continuous on their domain. Sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant they are all continuous on their domain. As long as you're within their domain, the continuity equation will work regardless of the location. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. That's all the functions we deal with here. Yeah, so these are all continuous on their domain. Um, now, I want you to be aware, it might sound like it's cheating. You might say something like, aren't all functions continuous on their domain? If the function is there, we're in the domain. It exists, right? Should, things should connect somehow in order for it to be a function. Um, let me just justify you, to you that this is not a, a trivial distinction. Um, so for example, I'll give you a very simple example. Maybe I'll give you a little bit more sophisticated one. Look at this function here. Not a terribly complicated function. It's very easy to understand. Right? This is a function that to the right is the function 1, to the left is the function negative 1, and at 0, 
it takes on the value one. I want you to appreciate that the domain of this function is what? Where does this function work? Give us a real number output. Yeah? All real numbers. On all real numbers. It is literally continuous. Yeah. Let's see, I almost caught myself. It is defined everywhere, but it is not continuous everywhere. We can see at zero there is a jump. So just because all the points, you can plug a point into a function, does not mean the function is continuous at that point. Right? So it's not something like, oh, I'm just saying this just to say it. No, right? Being continuous on your domain is a very special property. You can have a domain but not be continuous on that domain. So, but f is not continuous, i.e. not continuous on this specifically, it's not continuous at zero. So just because a function works everywhere doesn't mean it's continuous, right? These functions, though, and, and you can look at something like a polynomial, it works everywhere, and at the same time, it's continuous everywhere, right? That's a very special property to have. It's not, it's not exactly something that you can say, well, isn't that normal? It's not normal at all. I mean, most functions actually behave quite badly, right? We, we, in, in calculus, we actually deal with the very nice functions. The kind of functions where I would write down a definition on the board and you're like, why do we even need to know this definition? This obviously seems to work. Yeah, it works on every example we do in this class, but out there in the real world, functions can misbehave a lot. Um, step function is another example. Like the function that rounds up, for example, or rounds down, like y equals the floor function. Function that always cuts off the uh, decimal points. So 2.1, it outputs 2. 3.9, it outputs 3, right? You always just cut off the decimal part. That function is also defined on all numbers, but its graph would look like this. Right? At all the integers, we have discontinuities. Called a step function. That's the round down function. You also have a ceiling function, the round up function, um, where it just adds to get you to the next integer. So that domain is, again, all real numbers, but it's actually discontinuous at an infinite number of points. It's discontinuous at every integer. However, as long as we're dealing with these guys, things are very nice, and we tend to not have to worry about continuity. We'll stop there. Let's see. Either on Tuesday or halfway through Wednesday's class, we'll finish everything we want to talk about continuity. And then we'll actually start to talk about uh, derivatives. Which is what most people think of when they think calculus. Okay. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.